Chapter 35 The next evening, Cole Westfor stood on the second floor of the castle, looking over the courtyard. Below him, two figures slowly roved through the hedges. Selina's white cloak made it easy to spot, and Dorian could always be noticed by the empty circle of space around him. He should be down there, a foot behind, watching them, making sure she didn't seize Dorian and use him to escape. Logic and years of experience screamed at him to be with them, even though six guards trailed them. She was deceitful, cunning, vicious. But he couldn't make his feet move. With each day he felt the barriers melting. He let them melt. Because of a genuine laugh. Because he caught her one afternoon sleeping with her face in the middle of a book. Because he knew that she would win. She was a criminal. A prodigy at killing. A queen of the underworld. And yet... Yet she was just a girl. Sent at seventeen to Endeavour. It made him sick every time he thought about it. He'd been training with the guards at seventeen, but he'd still lived to the hill, still had a roof over his head, and good food and friends. Dorian had been in the middle of courting Rosamond when he was that age, not caring about anything. But she, at seventeen, had gone to a death camp and survived. He wasn't sure if he would, could survive end of her, let alone during the winter months. He'd never been whipped, Never seen anyone die. He'd never been cold and starving. Selina laughed at something Dorian said. She'd survived at Endeavour, and yet could still laugh. While it terrified him to see her down there, a hand's breadth away from Dorian's unprotected throat, what terrified him even more was that he trusted her, and he didn't know what that meant about himself. Selina walked between the hedges and couldn't help the smile that spread across her face. They walked closely, but not close enough to touch. Dorian had found her just moments after dinner and invited her for a walk. In fact, he'd showed up so quickly after the servants cleared away her food that she might have thought he'd been waiting outside. Of course, it was due entirely to the cone that she longed to link arms with him and absorb his warmth. The white, fur-lined cloak did little to help the frigid air from freezing all over her. She could only imagine how Nahimi would react to such temperatures. But after learning about the fates of those rebels, the princess was spending most of her time in her rooms, and had declined Selina's repeated offers to go for walks. It had been over three weeks since her last encounter with Eleanor, and she hadn't seen or heard of her or at all, despite the three tests she had, the most exciting of which being an obstacle course, which she passed with only a few minor scratches and bruises. Unfortunately, Pella hadn't done so well, and had been sent home at last. But he'd been lucky. Three other competitors had died, all found and forgotten always, all mutilated beyond recognition. Even Selena had taken to jumping at every strange sound. There were only six of them left now. Cain, Grave, Knox, a soldier and Renault, a vicious mercenary who stepped up to replace Varen as Cain's right-hand man. Not surprisingly, Renault's favourite new activity was taunting Selena. She shoved thoughts of the murders aside as they strode past the fountain, and she caught Dorian giving her an admiring glance from the corner of his eye. Of course, she hadn't been thinking of Dorian when she chose such a fine lavender gown to wear tonight, or when she had made sure her hair was so carefully arranged or that her white gloves were spotless. What to do now? Dorian said. We've walked twice around the garden. Don't you have princely duties to attend to? Selina winced as the gust of icy wind blew back her hood and froze her ears. When she recovered the hood, she found Dorian staring at her throat. What? she asked, pulling her cloak tightly around her. You always wear that necklace, he said. Is it another gift? Though she wore gloves, he glanced at her hand, where the amethyst ring always sat, and the spark died from his eyes. No, she covered the amulet with her hand. I found it in my jewelry box, and liked the look of it, you insufferably territorial man. It's very old looking. Been robbing the royal coffer, have you? He winked, but she didn't feel any warmth behind it. No, she repeated sharply. Even though a necklace wouldn't protect her from the murderer, and even though Eleanor had some agenda she was being cagey about, Selina wouldn't take it off. Its presence somehow comforted her in the long hours she sat up, watching her door. He continued, staring at her hand until she sh lowered it from her throat. He studied the necklace. When I was a boy, I used to read tales about the dawn of our darling, 
Gavin was my hero. I must have read every legend regarding the war with Erwin. How can he be that smart? He can't have figured it out so quickly. She tried her best to look innocently interested. And? Eleanor, first queen of Adalyn, had a magical amulet. In the battle with the Dark Lord, Gavin and Eleanor found themselves defenseless against him. He was about to kill the princess when a spirit appeared and gave her the necklace. And when she put it on, Erwin couldn't harm her. She saw the Dark Lord for what he was and called him by his true name. It surprised him so much that he became distracted and Gavin slew him. Dorian looked to the ground. They called her necklace the Eye of Eleanor. It's been lost for centuries. How strange it was to hear Dorian, son of the man who had banished out Lord all traces of magic, talking about powerful amulets. Still, she laughed as best as she could. And you think this trinket is the eye? I think it'd be dust by now. I suppose not, he said, and vigorously rubbed his arms for warmth. But I've seen a few illustrations of the eye, and your necklace looks like it. Perhaps it's a replica. Perhaps. She quickly, she quickly found another subject. When's your brother arriving? He looked skyward. I'm lucky. We received a letter this morning that snows in the mountains prevented Holland from coming home. He's stuck at school until after his spring term, and he's beside himself. Your poor mother, Selina said, half smiling. She'll probably send servants to deliver his Yorma's presents, regardless of the storm. Selena didn't hear him, and though they talked for a good hour afterward, meandering through the grounds, she couldn't get a heart to calm. Eleanor had to have known someone to recognize her amulet, and if this was the real thing, the king could kill her on the spot for wearing not only an heirloom of his house, but something of power. Yet again, she could only wonder what Eleanor's motives actually were. Selena glanced from a book to the tapestry on the wall. The chest of drawers remained where she shoved it in front of the passageway. She shook her head and returned to her book. Though she scanned the lines, none of the words registered. What did Eleanor want with her? Dead queens usually didn't come back to give orders to the living. Selena clenched her book. It wasn't like she wasn't fulfilling Eleanor's command to win, either. She would have fought this hard to become the king's champion anyway. And as for finding and defeating the evil in the castle, when well, now that it seemed tied to who was murdering the champions, how could she not try to figure out where it was coming from? A door shut somewhere inside her rooms, and Selina jumped, the book flying from her hands. She grabbed the brass candlestick beside her bed, ready to leap off the mattress, but lowered it as Philippa's humming filtered through the doors to her bedroom. She groaned as she climbed out of the warmth of her bed to retrieve her book. It had fallen under the bed, and Selina knelt under the icy floor, straining to reach the book. She couldn't feel it anywhere, so she grabbed the candle. She saw the book immediately tucked against the back wall, but as her fingers grappled onto the cover, a glimmer of candlelight traced a white line across the floor beneath the bed. Selina yanked the book back to her and stood with a jolt. Her hands trembled as she pushed the bed out of position, her feet slipping on the half-frozen floor. It moved, slowly, but eventually. She had shifted enough to see what had been sketched on the floor beneath. Everything inside of her turned to ice. Ward marks. Dozens of ward marks had been drawn to the floor with chalk. They formed a giant spiral with a large mark in its center. Selina stumbled back, slamming into her dresser. What was this? She ran a shaky hand through her hair, staring at the center mark. She'd seen that mark. It had been etched on one side of Erin's body. Her stomach rising in the throat, she rushed to her nightstand and grabbed the pitcher of water atop it. Without a thought, she tossed the water onto the marks, then raced to her bathroom chamber to draw more water. When the water had finished loosening the chalk, she took a towel and scrubbed the floor until her back ached and her legs and her hands were frozen. Only then did she throw on a pair of pants and a tunic and head out the door. Thankfully, the guards didn't say anything when she asked them to escort her to the library at midnight. They remained in the main room of the library as she set off through the stacks, heading towards the musty, forgotten alcove where she found the majority of the books and the ward marks. She couldn't walk fast enough, and kept looking over her shoulder. Was she next? What did any of it mean? She wrung her fingers. She rounded a corner not ten stacks from the alcove, and came to a halt. Nehemia, seated at a small desk, stared at her with wide eyes. Selina put a hand on her racing heart. Damn, she said. You gave me a fright. Nehemia smiled, but not very well. 
Selena cocked her head as she approached the table. What are you doing here? Nehemia demanded in Iwe. I couldn't sleep. She shifted her eyes to the princess's book. That was in the book they used during their lessons. No. It was a thick, aging book crammed with dense lines of text. What are you reading? Nehemia slammed the book shut and stood. Nothing. Selena observed her face. Her lips were pursed, and the princess lifted her chin. I thought you couldn't read all that at that level yet. Nehemia tucked the book into the crook of her arm. Then you like every ignorant fool in this castle, Lillian, she said with perfect pronunciation in the common tongue. Not giving her a chance to reply, the princess strode away. Selena watched her go. It didn't make sense. Nehemia couldn't read books that advanced, not when she still stumbled through lines of text. And Nehemia never spoke with that kind of flawless accent, and... In the shadows, behind the desk, a piece of paper had fallen between the wood and the stone wall. Easing it out, Selena unfolded the crumpled paper. She whirled around the direction when Nehemia disappeared, her throat constricting. Selena tucked the piece of paper into her pocket and hurried back towards the great room. The ward mark drawn on the paper, burning a hole in her clothing. Selena rushed down a staircase and strode along a hallway lined with books. No, Nehemia couldn't have played her like that. Nehemia wouldn't have lied day after day about how little she knew. Nehemia had been the one to tell her about the etchings in the gardens were ward marks. She knew what they were. She'd warned her to stay away from the ward marks again and again. Because Nehemia was her friend. Because Nehemia had wept when her people had been murdered. Because she'd come to her for comfort. But Nehemia had come from a conquered kingdom, and the king of Darlin had ripped the crown of her father's head and stripped his title from him. And the people of Eloy were being kidnapped in the night and sold into slavery, right along with the rebels the re that rumoured claimed Nehemia supported so fiercely, and five hundred Eloy citizens had just been butchered. Selena's eyes stung as she spotted the guards loitering in armchairs in the great room. Nehemia had every reason to deceive them, to plot against them, to tear apart this stupid competition and send everyone into a tizzy. Who better to target than the criminals living here? No one would miss them, but the fear would seep into the castle. But why would Nehemia plot against her? Chapter 36 Days passed without seeing Nehemia, and Selena kept her mouth shut about the incident to call Dorian, or anyone who visited her chambers. She couldn't confront Nehemia, not without more concrete proof, not without ruining everything. So she spent her spare time researching the ward marks, desperate for a way to decipher them, to find those symbols, to learn what it all meant, and how it connected to the killer and the killer's beast. Admits her worrying another test passed without incidents or embarrassment, though she couldn't say the same for the soldier who'd been sent home. And she kept up her intense training with Cole and the other champions. There were five of them left now. The final test was three days away and the duel two days after that. Selena awoke on Yorma's morning and relished the silence. There was something inherently peaceful about the day, despite the darkness of her encounter with Nehemia. For the moment, the whole castle had quietened to hear the falling snow. Frost laced each window pane, a fire already crackled in the fireplace, and shadows of snowflakes drifted across the floor. It was as peaceful and lovely a winter morning as she could imagine. She wouldn't ruin it with thoughts of Nehemia or of the duel or of the ball she wasn't allowed to attend tonight. No, it was Yuma's morning, and she would be happy. It didn't feel like a holiday to celebrate the darkness that gave birth to the spring light, nor did it feel like a holiday to ce celebrate the birth of the goddess's firstborn son. It was simply a day when people were more courteous, looked twice at a beggar on the street, Remembered that love was a living thing. Selena smiled and rolled over, but something got in her way. It was crinkly and harsh against her face, and had the distinct odour of candy. A large paper bag sat on a pillow, and she found that it was filled with all sorts of confectionery goodies. There was no note, not even a name scribbled on the bag. With a shrug and glowing eyes, Selena pulled out a handful of sweets. Oh, how she adored candy. Selena issued a jolly laugh and crammed some of the candy into her mouth. One by one, she chewed through the assortment, and as she closed her eyes and breathed in deeply as she tasted all the flavors and textures. When she finally stopped chewing, her jaw ached. She emptied the contents of the bag onto the bed, ignoring the dunes of sugar that poured out with it, and surveying the land of goodness before her. 
all of her favourites were there. Chocolate-covered gummies, chocolate almond bark, berry-shaped chews, gem-shaped hard sugar, peanut brittle, plain brittle sugar lace, frosted red nut licorice, and most importantly, chocolate. She popped a hazelnut truffle into her mouth. Someone, she said in, in between chews, is very good to me. She paused to examine the bag again. Who had sent it? Maybe Dorin? Certainly not he me recall. Nor the frost fairies that delivered presents to good people. Children. They stopped coming to her when she'd first drawn blood from another human being. Maybe Knox. He liked her well enough. Miss Selina! Philippa exclaimed from the doorway, gaping. Happy you, Miss Philippa, she said. Care for a candy? Philippa stormed towards Selina. Happy you'ness, you miss indeed. Look at this bed. Look at this mess. Selina winced. Your teeth are red, Philippa cried. She reached for the hand mirror Sel that Selina kept by her bed and held it up for the assassin to see. Sure enough, her teeth were tinged with crimson. She ran her tongue over her teeth and tried to brush away the stains with a finger. They remained. Damn those sugar suckers. Yes, Philippa snapped. And that's chocolate all over your mouth. Even my grandson doesn't eat his candy like this. She laughed. You have a grandson? Yes, and he can eat his food without getting it on the bed, on his teeth and on his face. Selina pushed back the covers, sugar spraying into the air. Have a candy, Philippa. It's seven in the morning. Philippa swept the sugar into her cupped hand. You'll make yourself sick. Sick? Who can get sick from candy? Selina made a face that exposed the crimson teeth. You look like a demon, said Philippa. Just don't open your mouth and no one will notice. You and I both know that's not possible. To her surprise, Philippa laughed. Happy you, Miss Selina, she said. Hearing Philippa call her by her name sent an unexpected burst of pleasure through her. Come, the servant clucked. Let's get you dressed. The ceremony begins at nine. Philippa bustled towards the dressing room and Selina watched her go. Her heart was big and as red as her teeth. There was good in people. Deep down, there was always a shred of good. There had to be. Selena emerged a while later, clad in a solemn-looking green dress that Philip had deemed the only appropriate gown for Templar attendants. Selena's teeth were, of course, still red, and now she felt queasy as she stared at the bag of candy. However, she quickly forgot about her sickness when she saw Dorian Havilliard sitting at the table in a bedroom with crossed legs. He wore a beautiful white and gold jacket. Are you my present, or is there something in that basket at your feet? She asked. If you'd like to unwrap me, he said, lifting the large wicker basket onto the table. We still have an hour until the temple service. She laughed. Happy you, Miss Dorian. And to you as well. I can see that I... Are your teeth red? She clamped her mouth shut, shaking her head in violent protestation. He grabbed her nose and pinched it close, and try as she might, she could not dislodge his fingers. She opened her mouth, and he burst into laughter. Been eating candies, have you? You sent those? She kept her mouth closed as much as possible. Of course. He picked up the brown bag of candy on the table. What's your... He trailed off as he weighed the bag in his hands. Didn't I give you three pounds of candy? She smiled impishly. You ate half the bag. Was I supposed to save it? I would have liked some. You never told me that, because I didn't expect you to consume all of it before breakfast. She snatched the bag from him and put it on the table. Well, that just shows poor judgment on your part, doesn't it? Dorian opened his mouth to reply, but the bag of candy tipped over and spilled across the table. Selina turned just in time to see the slender golden snout protruding from the basket, inching towards the candy. What is that? she asked flatly. Dorian grinned. Are you almost present? For you? The assassin flipped back the lid of the basket. The nose instantly shot inward, and Selina found the strange gold, golden-haired puppy quivering in the corner with a red bowl across her neck. Oh, puppy! She crooned and petted her. The dog trembled and she glared at Dorian over her shoulder. What did you do, you buffoon? She hissed. Dorian threw his hands in the air. It's a gift, 
I almost lost my arm and more important parts, trying to put that bow on. And then she howled all the way up here. Selena looked piteously at the dog, which was now licking the sugar off her fingers. What am I supposed to do with her? You couldn't find an owner, so you decided to give her to me. No, he said. Well, yes. But she didn't seem so frightened when you were around, and I remembered how my hounds followed you when we travelled from Endeavour. Perhaps she'll trust you enough to become more adapted to humans. Some people have these kind of gifts. She raised an eyebrow as he paced. It's a lousy present, I know. I should have gotten you something better. The dog peered up at Selena. Her eyes were a golden brown colour, like mottled molten caramel. She seemed to be waiting for a blow to fall. She was a beautiful thing, and a huge pause hinted that she might someday grow large and swift. A slow, slight smile spread on Selena's lips. The dog swished her tail once, and then another time. She's yours, Dorian said, if you want her. What shall I do if I'm sent back to Endeavour? I'll worry about that. Selina stroked her folded velvet soft ears, then ventured low enough to scratch his chin. The pup's tail wagged in earnest. Yes, there was life in her. So you don't want her, he muttered. Of course I want her, Selina said, then realised what the implications would be. But I want her trained. I don't want her urinating on everything and chewing on furniture and shoes and books. And I want her to sit when I tell her to, and when lay down and roll over and whatever it is that dogs do. And I want her to run, run with the other dogs when they're practicing. I want her to put those long legs to use. Dorian crossed his arms as Selena scooped up the dog. That's a long list of demands. Perhaps I should have brought you jewellery after all. When I'm training, she kissed the pup's soft head, and the dog nestled her cold nose against Selena's neck. I want her in the kennel's training as well. When I return in the afternoon, she may be brought to me. I'll keep her in the night. Selena held the dog at eye level. The dog kicked her legs in the air. If you ruin any of my shoes, she said to the pup, I'll turn you into a pair of slippers. Understood? The dog stared at her, her wrinkled brow lifting, and Selena smiled and set her down on the floor. She began sniffing around about, though she stayed far from Dorian, and she soon disappeared beneath the bed. The assassin lifted in the dusty ruffle to peer underneath. Thankfully, the ward marks had been washed away entirely. The dog continued her exploration, sniffing everywhere. I'll have to think of a name for you, she said to her, then stood. Thank you, she said to Dorian. It's a lovely gift. He was kind, unnaturally kind for someone of his upbringing. He had a heart, she realised, and a conscience. He was different from the others. Timidly, almost clumsily, the assassin strode over to the crown prince and kissed him on the cheek. His skin was surprisingly hot, and she wondered if she'd kissed him properly as she pulled away, and found his eyes bright and wide. Had she been sloppy, too wet, were her lips sticky from the candy? She hoped he wouldn't wipe his, che wipe his cheek. I'm sorry I don't have a present for you, she said. I, uh, I didn't expect you to. He blushed madly and glanced at the clock. I'll have to go. I'll see you at the ceremony, or perhaps tonight after the ball. I'll try to get away as early as I can, though I bet that without you here, Nehemia will probably do the same, so it won't look so bad if I leave early too. She'd never seen him babble like this. Enjoy yourself, she said, as he took a step back and almost crashed into the table. I'll see you tonight, then, he said, after the ball. She hid a smile behind her hand. Had her kiss thrown him into such a tizzy? Goodbye, Selina. He looked back when he reached the door. She smiled at him, flashing her red teeth, and he laughed before he bowed and disappeared. Alone in her room, Selina was about to see what her new companion was up to when the thought struck her. Nehemia would be at the ball. It was simple enough, though, th a thought at first. But then th worse thoughts followed it. Selina began pacing. If Nehemia were truly somewhere behind the champion's murders, and worse, had some feral beast at her command to destroy them, and also just learned about the massacre of her people. Then what better place to punish Adalin than at the ball, where so many of its royals would be celebrating unguarded? It was irrational, Selina knew, but what if? What if Nehemia unleashed whatever creature she controlled at the ball? Fine, she wouldn't mind if Caitlin and Perrington met horrible deaths, but Dorian would be there, 
and Cole. Selena strode to her bedroom, wriggling her fingers. She couldn't warn Cole, because if she were wrong, then it would ruin not just their friendship with Nehemia, but also the princess's efforts at diplomacy. But she couldn't just do nothing. Oh, she shouldn't even be thinking this. But she'd seen her friends do terrible things before, and it had become safer for her to believe the worst. She'd witnessed firsthand how far a need for revenge could drive someone. Perhaps Nehemia wouldn't do anything. Perhaps she was just being paranoid and ridiculous. But if something happened tonight? Selena opened the doors to her dressing room, surveying the glittering gowns hanging down along the walls. Cole would be beyond furious if she infiltrated the ball, but she couldn't handle it. She could handle it. She could handle it who decided to throw into the dungeons for a little while, too. Because somehow the thought of him getting hurt, or worse, made her willing to risk just about anything. Will you not even smile on your miss? She asked Cole as they walked out to the castle and towards the glass temple in the centre of the eastern garden. If my te teeth were crimson, I wouldn't be smiling at all, he said. Be content with an occasional grimace. She flashed her teeth at him, then closed her mouth as several courtiers strode past, servants in tow. I'm surprised you're not complaining more. Complaining about what? Why did Cole never joke with her as Dorian did? Perhaps he truly didn't find her attractive. The possibility of it stung more than she would have liked. About not going to the ball tonight? He glanced sidelong at her. He couldn't know what she was planning. Philippa had promised to keep it a secret. Promised not to ask questions when Selena requested she find a gown and a matching mask. Well, apparently you still don't trust me enough. She meant to sound sassy, but couldn't help the snag from her tone. She couldn't waste her time worrying about someone who clearly had no interest in her beyond the ridiculous competition. Cole snorted and there were thought a hint of a smile appeared on his lips. At least the crown prince never made her feel stupid or rotten. Cole just provoked her. The weird is good side, too. And she had no idea when she stopped loathing him so much. Still, she knew he wouldn't be pleased when she appeared at the ball tonight. Mask or no mask, Cole would know it was her. She just wished he wouldn't punish her too sever severely. Chapter 37 Seated in a pew at the rear of the spacious temple, Selena kept her mouth closed so tightly that it hurt. Her teeth were still red. She didn't need anyone else noticing. The temple was a beautiful space, built entirely from glass. The limestone covering the floor was all that remained of the original stone temple, which the king of Adalin had destroyed when he decided to replace it with a glass structure. Two columns of about a hundred rosewood pews stretched beneath the vaulted glass ceiling that let in so much light that no candles were needed during the day. Snow lay piled upon the translucent roof, casting patterns of sunshine throughout. As the walls were also glass, the stained windows above the altar appeared to hover in midair. She stood to peer over the heads of those sitting in front of her. Dorian and the Queen sat in the first pew, a row of guards immediately behind. The Duke and Caitlin sat on the other side of the aisle, and behind them were Nehemia and several others she didn't recognize. She didn't spy Knox or other remaining champions, or Cain. They let her come to this, but not to the ball. Sit down. Cole ground, pulling out her green gown. She made a face and dropped onto the cushioned bench. Several people stared at her. They wore gowns and jackets so elaborate that she wondered if the boar had been moved to lunchtime. The high priestess walked onto the stone platform and raised her hands above her head. The folds of a midnight blue gossamer brood fell around her and her white hair was long and unbound. An eight-pointed star was tattooed upon her brow in a shade of blue that matched her gown its sharp lines extending to a hairline. Welcome all, and may the blessings of the goddess and all her gods be upon you. Her voice echoed across the chamber to reach even those in the back. Selina stifled a yawn. She respected the gods, if they existed, and when it suited her to ask for their assistance. But religious ceremonies were brutal. It had been years and years since she'd attended anything this sort, and as the high priestess lowered her arms and stared at the crowd, the assassin shifted in a seat. It would be the usual prayers, then the Yulma's prayers, then the sermon and the songs, and then the procession of the gods. You're squirming already, Cole said under his breath. What time is it? She whispered, and he pinched her arm. 
Today, the priestess said, is the day on which we celebrate the end and the beginning of the great cycle. Today is the day on which the great goddess gave birth to her firstborn, Lumas, lord of the gods. With his birth, love was brought into Aurelia, and it banished the chaos that arose from the gates of the war. A weight pressed on her eyelids. She had woken up so early, and slept so little after that encounter with Nehemia. Unable to stop, Selina wandered into the land of sleep. Get up, Kaus now into her ear. Now. She sat up with a jolt, the whirl and bright and foggy. Several lesser nobles in a pew laughed silently. She gave Cole an unapologetic look and turned her gaze to the altar. The high priestess had finished her sermon and the songs of Yulmus were over. She only had to sit through the procession of the gods and then she would be free. How long was I asleep? she whispered. He didn't respond. How long was I asleep? she asked the end, and noticed a hint of red in his cheeks. You were asleep too. Until you began drooling on my shoulder. Such a self-righteous young man, she cooed, and he poked a leg. Pay attention. A choir of priestesses stepped off the platform. Selina yawned but nodded with the rest of the congregation as the choir gave the blessings. An organ sounded and everyone leaned to stare down the aisle for the possession of the gods. The sound of pattering footsteps filled the temple, and the congregation stood. Each blindfolded child was no more than ten years old, and though they looked rather foolish dressed in the costumes of the gods, there was something charming about it. Every year, nine children were chosen. If a child stopped before you, you received the blessings of the god and the smallest gift the child carried as a symbol of the god's favour. Fauna, god of war, stopped at the row near Dorian, but then moved to the right, across the aisle, to give the miniature silver sword to Duke Parrington. Not surprising. Clad in glistening wings, Lumas, god of love, strode past her. She crossed her arms. What a foolish tradition. Diana, goddess of the hunt and maidens, approached. Selina shifted from one foot to the other, wishing she hadn't demanded that Cole would give her the aisle seat. To her dread and dismay, the girl stopped before her and removed the blindfold. She was a pretty little thing. Her blonde hair hung in loose curls, and her brown eyes were flecked with green. The girl smiled at Selina and reached to touch the assassin's forehead. Selina's back began sweating as she felt hundreds of eyes upon her. May Diana, the huntress and protector of the young, bless and keep you this year. I bestow upon you the go this golden arrow as a symbol of her power and good graces. The girl bowed as she extended the slender arrow. Cole prodded her back, and Selina grabbed the arrow. You'll miss blessing to you, the girl said, and Selina nodded her thanks. She gripped the arrow as the girl bounded away. It couldn't be used, of course, but it was made of solid gold. It'll fetch a nice price. With a shrug, Selina handed the arrow to Cole. I suppose I'm not allowed to have this, she said, sitting down with the rest of the crowd. He put it back in her lap. I wouldn't want to attest the gods. She stared at him for a moment. Did he look different? Something had changed in his face. Nudging him with an elbow, Selina grinned. Chapter 38 Yarns of silk, clouds of powder, brushes, combs, pearls, and diamonds glistened before Selina's eyes. As Philippa arranged the last strand of Selina's hair neatly around her face, secured a mask over her eyes and nose, and placed a small crystal tiara on her head, Selina couldn't help but feel, despite herself, like a princess. Philippa knelt to polish the lump of crystal on Selina's silver slippers. If I didn't know better, I'd call myself a fairy queen. It's like my... Philippa caught herself before she spoke the word the king of Adalin had so effectively outlawed, then quickly said, I barely recognize you. Good, Selina said. This would be a first ball where she wasn't there to kill anyone. True, she was mostly going to make sure Nehemi didn't hurt herself or the court, but a ball was a ball. Maybe if she was lucky, she could dance a little. Are you certain this is a good idea? Philippa asked quietly, standing. Captain Westfall won't be pleased. Selina gave the servant a sharp look. I told you not to ask questions. Philippa huffed. Just don't tell them I helped you when you get dragged back here. Checking her irritation, Selina strode to the mirror. Philippa bustling after her. Standing before her reflection, Selina wondered if she was seen correctly. 
This is the most beautiful dress I've ever worn, she admitted, her eyes filling with light. It was not pure white, but rather a greyish offset, and its wide skirts and bodice were encrusted with thousands of minuscule crystals that reminded Selena of the surface of the sea. Swirls of silk thread on the bodice made rose-like designs that could have passed for a work by any master painter. A border of ermine lined the neck and provided slender sleeves that only covered her shoulders. Tiny diamond droplets fell from her ears, and her hair was curled and swept up onto her head, strands of pearls woven in. Her grey silk mask had been secured tightly around her face. It wasn't fashioned after anything, but the delicate crystal and pearl whorls had been crafted by a skilled hand. You could win the hand of a king looking like that, said Philippa, or perhaps a crown prince would do. Where in Aurelia did you find this dress? Selina murmured. Don't ask questions, clucked the old woman. Selina smirked. Fair enough. She wondered why her heart now felt too large for her body, and why she was so unstable in her shoes. She had to remember why she was going. She had to keep her wits about her. The clock struck nine, and Philippa glanced towards the doorway, giving Selina the opportunity to make to slip her makeshift knife down her bodice without being noticed. How exactly are you going to get to the ball? I don't think your guards will let you just walk out. Selina shot Philippa a sly look. We're both going to pretend that I, that I was invited by the Crown Prince. And right now you are going to make such a fuss about me being late that they won't object. Philippa found herself, her face reddening. Selina grasped her hand. I promise, she said. If I get into any sort of trouble, I'll swear to my last breath that you were deceived by me. And no knowledge of anything. But are you going to get into trouble? Selina gave her a most winning smile. No. I'm just sick of being left to sit around while they have such grand parties. It wasn't quite a lie. God help me, Philippa muttered and took a deep breath. Go, she suddenly cried, herding Selina towards the door to the hall. Go, you'll be late. She was a bit too loud to be totally convincing, but... Philippa flung open the door to the hallway. The crown prince won't be pleased if you're late. Selina paused in the doorway, nodding at the five guards who were posted outside, then looked back at Philippa. Thank you, Selina said. No more dawdling, the servant woman cried, and almost knocked Selina off her feet as she pushed her out the doorway and slammed it shut. Selina turned to the guards. You look nice, one of them, Ress, said shyly. Off to the ball, grinned another. Save a dance for me, will you? The third added. Not one of them questioned her. Selina smiled and took Ress's arm as he extended it at her. She tried not to laugh when he puffed at his chest. But as they neared the great hall and the sound of a waltz could be heard, a swarm of bees took flight in her stomach. She couldn't forget why she was here. She played this part in the past, but it ended up in killing a stranger, not confronting a friend. The red and gold doors appeared, and she could see the wreaths and candles that bedecked the massive hall. It would have been easier if she could have slipped into the ball through a side door and remained unnoticed, but she hadn't had time to go exploring through the secret tunnels to find another way out of her rooms and she certainly couldn't find another way into the hall right now without raising suspicions. Rest stopped and bowed. This is where I leave you, he said as seriously as he could, though he kept looking at the board that lay at the foot of the stairs. Have a lovely night, Miss Sardathene. Thank you, Ress. She felt an urge to vomit, and ran back to her rooms. But instead, she graciously nodded her farewell. She just had to make it down the stairs and find a way to convince Cole to let her stay. Then she could keep an eye on Nahima all night. Her shoes seemed frail, and Selina took a few steps back, ignoring the guards at the door as she lifted her high feet and set them down to test the strength of the shoes. Then she was assured that, she, that not even a jump through the air could snap the heel. She approached the top of the stairs. Tucked into her bodice, the makeshift knife poked her skin. She prayed to the goddess, to every god she knew, to the ward, to whatever was responsible for her fate, that she wouldn't have to use it. Selina squared her shoulders and stepped forward. What was she doing here? Dorian almost dropped his drink as he saw Selina Sardathene atop the stairs. Even with the mask, he recognised her. She might have her faults, but Selina never did anything half-heartedly. She'd outdone herself with that dress. But what was she doing here? He couldn't tell if it were a dream or a reality until several heads. Then many turned to look. Though the waltz was playing, those not dancing quieted themselves as a mysterious masked girl 
lifted her skirts and took a step, then another. Her dress was made of stars plucked from the sky, and the whirls of crystal and a grey mask glittered. Who is that? breathed a young courtier beside him. She looked at no one as she descended the staircase, and even the Queen of Darlin stood to see the late arrival. Nehemia also rising from a seat beside her. Had Selena lost her mind? Walked to her, took her hand, but his feet were leaden, and Dorian could do nothing except watch her. His skin flushed beneath his small black mask. He didn't know why, but seeing her made him feel like a man. She was something out of a dream, a dream in which he was not a spoiled young prince, but a king. She reached the bottom of the stairs, and Dorian took a step forward. But someone had already arrived, and Dorian clenched his jaw tight enough for it to hurt, as she smiled and bowed to Cole. The captain of the guard, who hadn't bothered to wear a mask, extended his hand. Selina stared only at Cole with those starlit lies, eyes, and her long white fingers floated through the air to meet it. The crowd began chattering as Cole led her from the stairs and it disappeared into the throng. Whatever conversation they were about to have, it wasn't going to be pleasant. He'd be better off staying out of it. Please, said another courtier, tell me that Cole doesn't suddenly have a wife. Captain Westfall? So the courtier had spoken earlier. Why would a pretty thing like that marry a guard? Remembering who stood beside him, he glanced at Dorian, who was still staring wide-eyed at the stairs. Who is she, your highness? Do you know her? No. I don't, whispered Dorian, and walked away. The waltz was driving, and so loud she had difficulty hearing herself think as Cole pulled her into a shadowy alcove. Not surprisingly, he hadn't worn a mask. It would be too silly for him, which made the fury on his face all too visible. So, he seethed, holding tightly to her wrist. Do you want to tell me how you got it into your mind that this was a good idea? She tried shaking off his hand, but he wouldn't let go. Across the great hall, Nehemia sat with the Queen of Adalin, occasionally glancing in Selene's direction. But she was nervous, because she was nervous, or just surprised to see her. Relax, she hissed at the captain of the guard. I only wanted to have some fun. Fun? Crushing a royal boar is your idea of fun? Arguing wouldn't help. She could tell that his anger was mostly about being embarrassed that she managed to slip out of her rooms in the first place. So she gave him a pitiful pout. I was lonely. He choked. You couldn't spend one evening on your own? She twisted her wrist out of his grasp. Nox is here, and he's a thief. How could you let him come with all this jewellery flashing about, and not me? How can I be the king's champion if you don't trust me? Actually, that was a question she really wanted to know the answer to. Cole covered his face with a hand and let out a long, long sigh. She tried not to smile. She'd won. If you take one step out of line, she grinned in earnest. Consider it your humorous present to me. Cole gave her a weighing look, but slumped his shoulders. Please, don't make me regret this. She patted his cheek and swooped, swooping past him. I knew I liked you for some reason. He said nothing but followed her back into the crowd. She'd been to masked balls before, but there was still something unnerving about not being able to see the faces of those around her. Most of the court, Dorian included, wore masks of varying sizes, shapes and colours, some of simple design, others elaborate and animal-shaped. Nehemia still sat with the queen, wearing a gold and turquoise mask with a lotus motif. They appeared to be engaged in polite conversation, and Hemia's guards stood to the side of the dais, already looking bored. Cole kept close to her as she found an empty spot in the crowd and stopped. It was a good vantage point. She could see everything from here. The dais, the main steps, the dance floor. Dorian was dancing with a small brunette with outrageously large breasts that he took no pains to avoid glancing at every so often. Hadn't he noticed her arrival? Even Perrington had seen her when Cole dragged into that corner. Thankfully, the captain had suddenly moved her away before she had to interact with him. Across the room, she met Nox's eye. He was flirting with a young woman wearing a dove mask, and he raised his glass in salute before turning back to the girl. He'd opted for a blue mask that concealed only his eyes. Well, try not to have too much fun, Cole said beside her, crossing his arms. Hiding a scowl, Selina crossed her arms as well and began a vigil. An hour later, Selina was beginning to curse herself for being a fool. Nehemia was still sitting with the queen, and hadn't again looked again in Selina's direction. 
How had she even considered that Nehemia, Nehemia of all people, would attack everyone? Selena's face burned with shame beneath the mask. She didn't deserve to call herself a friend. All the dead champions and mysterious evil powers in its ridiculous competition had made a god mad. Selena smoothed the fur of her dress, frowning slightly. Cole remained beside her, saying nothing. Though he'd allowed her to stay, she doubted he'd soon forget this, or that the guards wouldn't get the tongue lashing of their lives later tonight. Selena straightened as Nehemia suddenly rose from her seat beside the queen's throne, her guards snapping to attention. She bowed her head to the queen, the light, the chandeliers making a mask glint, and then strode off the dais. Selena felt each of her heartbeats hammering in her veins as Selena, as Nehemia wove through the crowd, her guards close behind and halted in front of Selena and Cole. You look beautiful, Lillian, Nehemia said in the common tongue, her accent as thick as it had ever been. It felt like a slap in the face. She'd spoken with perfect fluency that night in the library. Was she warning Selena to keep quiet about it? As to you, Selena said tightly, are you enjoying the ball? Nehemia folded, played with a fold in her dress, and from the look of the rich blue fabric, it is probably a gift from the Queen of Adalan. Yes, but I'm not feeling well, the princess said. I'm going back to my rooms. Selena gave her a stiff nod. I hope you feel better, was all she could think of to say. Nehemia looked at her for a long moment, her eyes shining with what seemed like pain, and then left. Selena watched her walk up the stairs, and didn't hear tear her gaze away until the princess was gone. Cole cleared his throat. Do you want to tell me what that was all about? None of your business, she replied. Something could still happen, even if Nehemia wasn't here. Something could happen, but no. Nehemia wouldn't repay pain with more pain. She was too good for that. Selena swallowed hard. The makeshift knife in her bodice felt like a dead weight. Even if Nehemia wasn't going to hurt anyone tonight, that didn't prove her innocence. What's wrong? Cole pressed. Forcing herself to push aside her shame and worry, Selena lifted her chin. With Nehemia gone, she still had to keep watch, but maybe she could attempt to have a little fun too. With you scowling at everyone, no one will ask me to dance. Cole's dark brows rose. I'm not scowling at everyone. Even as he said it, she spotted him frowning at a passing courtier who looked too long in Selena's direction. Stop it, she hissed. No one will ever ask me to dance if you keep doing that. He gave her an exasperated look and strode off. She followed him to the border of the dance floor. Here, he said, standing at the edge of the sea of swelling gowns. If anyone wants to ask you to dance, you're in plain sight. From this spot, she could also still make sure no feral beasts were about to rip into the crowd. But he didn't need to know that. She glanced at him. Would you like to dance with me? He laughed. With you? No. She looked at the marble floor, her chest tight. You needn't be so cruel. Cruel? Selena? Parrington is just over there. I'm sure he's not happy about you being here, so I wouldn't risk drawing his attention any more than necessary. Coward. Cole's eyes softened. If you weren't here, I would have said yes. I can easily arrange that, you know. He shook his head as he adjusted the lapel on his dark black tunic. Just then, Dorian walked by, sweeping the brunette with him. He didn't even glance at her. Anyway, Carl added, jerking his chin at Dorian. I think you have far more attractive suitors vying for your attention. I'm boring company to keep. I don't mind being here with you. I'm sure you don't, Carl said dryly, though he met a stare. I mean it. Why aren't you dancing with anyone? Aren't there ladies whom you like? I'm the captain of the guard. I'm not exactly a catch for any of them. There was some sorrow in his eyes, though it was well concealed. Are you mad? You're better than everyone in here, and you're... You're very handsome, she said, taking his hand in a free one. There was beauty on Cole's face, and strength, and honour and loyalty. She stopped hearing the crowd, and her mouth became dry as, she, as he stared at her. How long had she missed it? You think so? He said after a moment, looking at the clasped hands. She tightened her grasp. Why, if I wasn't... Why aren't you two dancing? Cole dropped her hand. She had difficulty turning away from him. And whom would I dance? 
And with whom would I dance, Your Highness? Dorian was alarmingly handsome in his pewter tunic. One might say it matched her dress. You look radiant, he said. And you look radiant as well, Cole. He grinned and winked at his friend. Then Dorian's gaze met hers, and Selena's blood turned into shooting stars. Well, do I need to lecture you about how stupid it was to sneak into the ball? Or can I just ask you to dance with me instead? I don't think that's a good idea, Cole said. Why? they asked in unison. Dorian stepped a little closer to her, even though she was ashamed of herself for believing such awful things about Nehemia. Knowing that Dorian and Cole were safe made the misery worth it. Because it attracts too much attention, that's why. Selina rolled her eyes and Cole glared at her. Do I have to remind you who you are? No, you remind me every day, she retorted. His brown eyes darkened. What was the point of being nice to her, if he was only going to insult her the next day? Dorian put a hand on her shoulder and gave Cole a charming smile. Relax, Cole, he said, and his hand slipped to rest on her back, his fingers grazing her bare skin. Just take the night off, Dorian turned her from the captain. It'll do you some good, he said over his shoulder, though the merriness faded from his tone. I'm getting a drink, muttered Cole and walked away. She watched the captain for a moment. It would be a miracle if he considered her a friend. Dorian caressed her back, and she looked at him. Her heart jumped into a gallop and cold dissolved from her thoughts, like dew beneath the morning sun. She felt bad for forgetting him, but... but... Oh, she wanted Dorian. She couldn't deny it. She wanted him. You look beautiful, Dorian said quietly, running an eye over her in a way that made her ears burn. I haven't been able to stop staring at you. Oh, and I thought you hadn't even noticed me. Cole got there first when you arrived, and besides, I had to work up the nerve to approach you, he grinned. You're very intimidating, especially with a mask. And I suppose it didn't help that you had a line of ladies waiting to dance with you. I'm here now, aren't I? Her heart tightened, and she realized it wasn't the answer she'd been hoping for. What did she want from him? He held out his hand, inclining his head. Dance with me? Was there music playing? She'd forgotten. The world had shrunk into nothing, dissolved by the golden glow of candles. But there were her feet, and here was her hand, her arm, and her neck, and her mouth. She smiled and took his hand, still keeping one eye on the ball around them. Chapter 9 He was lost. Lost in a world which she'd always dreamed. Her body was warm beneath his hand, and her fingers were soft around his. He spun her and led her about the floor, waltzing as smoothly as he could. She didn't falter a single step, nor did she seem to care about the many angry female faces that watched as dance after dance passed and they didn't switch partners. Of course, it wasn't polite for a prince to dance with only one lady, but he couldn't focus on anything beyond his partner and the music that carried them onward. You certainly have a lot of stamina, she said. When had they last spoken? It could have been ten minutes or an hour ago. The masked faces around them blurred together. Or well, some parents hit their children. Mine also punished me with dancing lessons. Then you must have been a very naughty boy. She glanced around the ball, as if she were looking for something. Or someone. You're gracious with your compliments tonight, he twirled her. The skirts of her gown sparkled underneath the chandelier. It's your miss, she said. Everyone's kind on your miss. A flash of what he could have sworn was pain shone in her eyes, but it was gone before he could be certain of it. He caught her around the waist, his feet moving to the beat of the waltz. And how's your present? Oh, she hid under my bed, then in the dining room, which is where I left her. You locked the dog in your dining room? Well, should I have kept her in my bedroom, where she could ruin the carpets? Or in the gaming room, where she might eat the chess pieces and choke? Perhaps you should have sent her to the kennels, where the dogs belong. On your miss? I couldn't think of sending her back to that wretched place. He suddenly felt the urge to kiss her, hard upon the mouth. But this, what he felt, it could never be real. Because once the war was over... She would go back to being an assassin, and he would still be a prince. 
Dorian swallowed hard. For tonight, though. He held her close. Everyone transformed into mere shadows on the wall. Frowning, Cole watched his friend dance with the assassin. He wouldn't have danced with her anyway. And he was glad he hadn't worked up the nerve to ask her, not after seeing the colour that Duke Parrington's face turned upon discovering the pair. A courtier named Otho stepped beside Cole. I thought she was with you. Who? Lady Lillian. So that's her name. I've never seen her before. Is she newly arrived to court? Yes, said Cole. Tomorrow he'd have a word with the guards about letting Selina out tonight. Hopefully by then he'd be less inclined to knock their heads together. How are you doing, Captain Westfall? Otho said, clapping him on the back a bit too hard. His breath reeked of wine. You don't dine with us anymore. I stopped dining at your table three years ago, Otho. You should come back. We miss your conversation. It was a lie. Otho only wanted information about the foreign young lady. His reputation with women was well known in the castle. So well known that he had seized courtiers as they arrived, or going to rift hold for a different sort of woman. Cole watched Dorian dip Selina, watched the way her lips widened in a smile and her eyes burst with light, as the crown prince said something. Even with the mask on, Cole could see the happiness written across her face. Is he with her? Otho asked. The Lady Lillian belongs to herself, and no one else. So she's not with him? No. Otho shrugged. That's strange. Why? Cole had the sudden urge to strangle him. Because it looks like he's in love with her, he said, and walked away. Cole's eyes lost focus for a moment, and Selina laughed and Dorian kept staring at her. The prince hadn't once taken his eyes off her. Dorian's expression was full of something. Joy? Wonder? His shoulders were straight, his back erect. He looked like a man, like a king. It was impossible for such a thing to have occurred. And when would it have happened? Otho was a drunk and a womanizer. What did he know of love? Dorian spun Selina with speed and dexterity, and she snapped into his arms, her shoulders rising with exhilaration. But she wasn't in love with him. Otho hadn't said that. He had seen no attachment on her part. And Selina would never be that stupid. It was Dorian who was the fool. Dorian who would have his heart broken if he didn't actually love her. Unable to look at his friend any longer, the captain of the guard left the ball. Caitlin watched in rage and agony as Lillian Gordiana and the crown prince of Adalance danced and danced and danced. Even with a much more concealing mask, she would have recognized the upstart. And what sort of a person wore grey to a ball? Caitlin looked down at her dress and smiled. Bright shades of blue, emerald and soft brown, her gown and matching peacock mask had cost as much as a small house. It was all a gift from Parrington, of course, along with the jewellery that decorated much of her neck and arms. It was certainly not the dull and drab mess of crystal that this conniving harlot wore. Parrington stroked her arm, and Caitlin turned to him with fluttering eyelashes. You look handsome tonight, my love, she said, adjusting the gold chain across his red tunic. His face quickly matched the colour of his clothes. She wondered if she could bear the repulsion of kissing him. She could always keep refusing, just as she had for the past month, but when he was this drunk. She would have to think of a way out as soon as possible, but she was no closer to Dorian than she'd been in early autumn, and would certainly make no progress with Lillian in the way. A precipice opened before her. Her head gave a brief, faint throb of pain. There were no other options now. Lillian had to be eliminated. When the clock chimed three and most of the guests, including the Queen and Cole, had left, Selena finally decided that it was safe for her to leave. So she slipped from the ball when Dorian went to get a drink and found rest waiting outside to escort her back. The halls of the castle were silent as they strode into her room, taking the empty servants' passages to avoid any too curious courtiers learning more about her. Even if she'd gone to the ball for wrong reasons, she had some fun dancing with Dorian, more than some actually. She smiled to herself, picking out her nails as they entered the hallway that led to her rooms. The rush of having Dorian look only at her, talk only to her, treat her as if she were his equal, and more hadn't yet worn off. 
Maybe her plan hadn't been such a failure after all. Russ cleared his throat, and Selena looked up to see Dorian standing outside her rooms, chatting with the guards. He couldn't have stayed long in the bore if he'd beaten her back here. Her heart pounded, but she managed a coy smile as Dorian bowed to her, opening the door, and they went inside. Let Russ and the guards think what they wanted. She unfastened the mask from her face, tossing it onto the table in the centre of the foyer, and sighed as the cool air met her flushed skin. Well, she asked, leaning against the wall beside the door to her bedroom. Dorian approached her slowly, halting only a hand's breadth away. You left the ball without saying goodbye, he said, and braced an arm against the wall beside her head. She raised her eyes, examining the black detail on the sleeve that fell just above her hair. I'm impressed you got here so quickly, and without a pack of court ladies hounding after you, Perhaps you should try a hand at being an assassin. He shook the hair out of his face. I'm not interested in court ladies, he said thickly and kissed her. His mouth was warm and his lips were smooth, and Selena lost all sense of time and place as she slowly kissed him back. She pulled away for a moment, looking into her eyes as they opened, and kissed her again. It was different this time, deeper, full of meaning. Her arms were heavy and light all at once, and the room twirled round and round. She couldn't stop. She liked this, liked being kissed by him, liked the smell and the taste and the feel of him. His arms slipped around her waist, and he held her tightly to him. As his lips moved against hers, she put a hand on his shoulder, her fingers digging into the muscle that lay beneath. How different things were between them than when she'd first seen him in Endeavour. Her eyes opened. Endeavour. Why was she kissing the crown prince of Adalin? Her fingers loosened and her arm dropped to her side. He removed his mouth from hers and smiled. It was infectious. Dorian leaned forward again, but she smoothly put two fingers against his lips. I should go to bed, she said. He raised his eyebrows. Alone, she added. He removed her fingers from his mouth. He tried to kiss her, but she swung easily under his arm and reached for the door handle. She had opened the bedroom door and slid inside before he could stop her. She peered into the foyer, watching as he continued to smile. Good night. Dorian leaned against the door, bringing his face close to hers. Good night, he whispered, and she didn't stop him as he kissed her again. He broke it off before she was ready, and she almost fell onto the ground as he removed his weight from the door. He laughed softly. Good night, she said again, heat rushing to her face. Then he was gone. Selina strode to the balcony and flung open the doors, embracing the chill air. Her hand rose to her lips, and she stared up at the stars, feeling her heart grow and grow and grow. Dorian walked slowly back to his rooms, his heart racing. He could still feel her lips on his, smell the scent of her hair, and see the gold in her eyes flickering in the candlelight. Consequences be damned. He'd find a way to make it work. He'd find a way to be with her. He had to. He had leapt from the cliff. He could only wait for the net. In the garden, the captain of the guard stared up at the young woman's balcony, watching as she waltzed alone, lost in her dreams. But he knew that her thoughts weren't of him. She stopped and stared upward. Even from a distance, he could see the blush upon her cheeks. She seemed young. No. New. It made his chest ache. Still he watched watched until she sighed and went inside. She never bothered to look below.